to, it's tough to own up to that. But, but the fact is that you really do have to, and you may end up not, you know, in a different situation, uh, uh, you know, down the road. But you have to really come to grips with who you are right now. The interview is is tomorrow. I mean, I started doing fake fingernails because I either was going to gain weight or have really good looking fingernails. The next day, I was going to lose weight, excuse me, lose weight or have fake fingernails. And so, you know, it had to be the nails. But, you know, so if your interview is that day, you know, you don't have a lot of choice about uh, what you weigh, but you do have a lot of choice about how you dress in connection with that. So you have to have a wardrobe, a business wardrobe that really does comport with who you are. And wearing clothes that are too tight makes you look uh, bad in all kinds of ways. And for one thing, it looks like you can't afford to wear stuff that, in fact, uh, you know, acquits you in your best, when you're putting your best foot forward. So you don't want low cut stuff of any sort. You don't want stuff that's too short. You do not want stuff that's too tight. On the other hand, uh, you don't want stuff that's too loose either. You don't want to wear peasant stuff like I used to do. You don't, you don't want to wear, uh, 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 clothes that, that really are kind of inappropriate in style because of the fact that you don't want to accentuate the fact that uh, that uh, that you uh, aren't exactly where you want to be weight-wise. So I would say that you wear, for tailoring, no matter if you're a size uh, uh, 18 or you're a size 2, you can always go to a local cleaners and you get you find out among the lot. There were about 100 local cleaners near me in Manhattan when I lived there for many years. Some were expensive, some were cheap, some were really bad at it, some were good. There are real tailors, but they tend to be more expensive. But you can go to a local cleaner and they will be able to sort of tailor whatever it is you brought into them to sort of fit you as best it, it can under the circumstances. Uh, and uh, and you would and you know I, I never thought of I would ever advise this uh, but there are clothing consultants that can make you sort of think a little bit outside the box as they used to say uh, uh, that can you know you're used to wearing a certain style and a certain way of, and you're used to doing things in a certain way and you think you look good in it and it sometimes can pay to actually pay somebody once. To sort of say, you may think you look good in that, and you might have 10 years ago, but you don't now. It's just, you have to face facts. It's hard for friends to do that. If your mother does it, you don't, you know, never good. Uh, <laughs> although my mother one day said to me, uh, when I was at the Bar Association running the bar, she said, so it is it to be a bun from here on out. And the next day I went and I cut my hair. <laughs> uh, so, you know, mothers can have a lot of uh, Influence. But if you actually paid somebody just on a one-shot deal that is well recommended, who can really say to you, look, you know, the style you have might have been okay then, it's not okay now. And here are some things you can do. They can actually open up to you. They, they'll take you to a department store or to H&M or one of those ways and, and basically point out to you that the way you're built right now and the kinds of things that you have to do with your life right now, here are some options. And you can end up rejecting all of it, but it's going to open your eyes a little bit, and they're in a better position to really tell you things you might not want to hear. But also, they tend to tell you things that you really didn't think of uh, at all. For example, what was discussed earlier by both of these two women, you know, the accessory thing. You know, you can wear a very formal black suit, but have a red scarf if you know how to do it. American women, yeah, the French women know how to tie scarves. Uh, but you know they'll, they'll teach you that at any department store. And so if you look at, if you walk into some expensive department store and ask one of those swanye women how to tie a scarf, she'll she'll show you, actually, and it's a valuable, valuable piece of, of advice. Um, so uh, you know, I guess in conclusion, I think you want to have a style, of, uh, uh, but it, your style changes over time, and it may change based on some good advice that you get uh, and some good tailoring. I do think that in tailoring is important, um, in particular because I think you have to consider that you guys are starting out in your career and you're all young and attractive. And that can both be an uh, advantage and a disadvantage, right? And so in terms of um, how you dress, you want to project confidence, even though you may not have you know, 10 or 20 years of experience but um, you don't want them to remember you as, you know, like I, I will tell you guys, there was one incident where um, when we were interviewing for associates for a job, um, someone came in and they, I don't even remember meeting her, I'm sure I did. She came in a suit, but the 
only thing that anyone talked about after she left was the fact that when she took off her her um, suit jacket, she was wearing a blouse with spaghetti straps. And so she was literally known as the girl with spaghetti straps. And um, I don't know if she was hired, I mean, but that was what we remembered her as, was the girl with spaghetti strap shirt. Um, and that's not how you want to be remembered. You want to be remembered as the confident, competent, able people that you are. And so when you have clothing that doesn't fit quite right or that shows a little too much, um, that's not what the people are going to notice first. It doesn't mean that you're not confident and able. It just means that what they may pick up on first is something that you may not want to emphasize. We haven't even talked about hair. I guess that's later. Yeah, we have hair uh, later. Um, I, but I did bring my hat <laughs> just to, uh, to to tell you the story of the hat, which is almost the exact opposite of what we've been talking about here. And that is, when I became the executive director and general counsel of the San Francisco Bar, I had been a civil rights lawyer, and there was a certain amount of deep distrust by uh, some of the senior lawyer types about somebody like me uh, with my politics coming in as head of the bar. So two things happened sort of early on and when I first started having to go to these people for money mostly. But the first thing that happened was that Felton Henderson, who is now a district court judge and who is an old boyfriend of mine and a good, very close friend, Felton knew that there was this problem in the uh, you know, have legitimacy in this in this job at the very, very beginning. Although I was highly respected by the people that I practiced law with, the people who ran the ACLU that I was in the chair of and so on, but generally I didn't know the sort of older white guys that really ran the bar. All right, so he wrote me a letter on, on court stationery that said, Dear Drewski, which is what he called me, that made it very clear that we were friends. Dear Drewski, he says, um, we have, as you know, the Chief Justice has asked that all chiefs of district courts um, recommend to him prominent lawyers in the community who would like to be on you know, one of these committees, a useless committee, but the kind that these guys would push their mother down an elevator shaft to get on, okay? <laughs> such and such a committee. I would like you to recommend to me uh, who you think from the San Francisco Bar ought to be on this committee. And in order to let people know uh, that they ought to contact you if they have an interest, I appreciate your sending this letter to people who might be interested. Well, the Dear Drewski letter went out to these guys. <laughs> and basically, I started to get phone calls from the same people who, you know, I hadn't heard from yet. And it was a kind of a, well, uh, Drewski. <laughs> Anyhow, it helped. It legitimized me, and that's the that's one of the things that you need to do for people coming up behind you. Uh, but it uh, it it helped me get into that that job. Getting to the dress situation. Uh, about three years after I was in the job, I uh, went into a store that um, I had no business. I had no idea what it was, and it was not a store that I would ever buy anything at. But suddenly, I saw a hat rack, and I decided to just buy a hat. Uh, and so I bought a hat for the first time with a veil, and I was on my way to hit up a managing partner for money. And so this is a little more, much more outlandish than the hat that I got. But I generally wear hats with veils uh, in uh, you know, cocktail parties and that kind of stuff. Uh, what happened was when I went to ask, I just kept the hat on when I went to ask this guy for money, and it became clear that he did not know what to do with the hat. <laughs> he was, it's like putting microbial genetics on your resume. He just didn't know what to do with the hat. He, he was intimidated, but at the same time sort of intrigued. It was clearly something only a woman would wear, so it did have the hint of that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, it was very old fashioned. Um, and, uh, and the older the man, the more he likes hats with veils. And I realized that it just threw him off his feet enough that he was going to give me more money than he had planned. <laughs> <laughs> so I have found that wearing a hat, uh, for in, if you're in a job where you're constantly begging for money, as I am, basically makes a statement. I am somebody to be reckoned with. Okay. And 
And, uh, and for the most, now some people think it's ridiculous, I'm sure, they, they are not the ones who tell me what they think of my accent. <laughs> but it really, that, it was by accident that I discovered this, but sometimes that kind of a little trademark thing, Tanya Neiman, who ran the Volunteer Legal Services Program, the Bar Association of San Francisco, who was the Volunteer Legal Services Program, was a, the most brilliant legal services person I have ever known. Tanya wore, uh, had a kind of a uniform that she wore. She wore uh, Wilkes Bashford's man tailored suits and a hat, uh, kind of a fedora kind of a hat. And it was kind of her trademark and people loved it. And, uh, and I think that and she was one of the most effective fundraisers I've ever known. So you have to be of a certain age and you have to have been in, by that time I'd been in practice for you know 15 years. I mean, but that was a long time ago that I started with the bar. But, but, uh, but the fact is that sometimes uh, affectations of that sort can be very uh, effective. Uh, so, and and a, a lesser variant of that, again, is if you're wearing a black suit or a dark suit, but you wear a pin like this, it has a little bit of glitter to it, but in, in a kind of a, of a muted way. You know, nobody could really complain about it. And it's not tacky. On the other hand, it, it's a little je ne sais quoi, you know, a little bit, little piece of pizzazz. And I believe deeply in little pieces of pizzazz, even when you're in court, as long as it's, I wouldn't wear this in court, but I would wear something, a smaller version of it, for example. Okay. Um, so the next topic is shoes. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I just wanted to cover just some last topics. Some of these are really high heels, some of these are flats. Some of them are dark, some of them are patterned. And then we've got a second page of boots with suits. And we've got open toed shoes and thigh high boots. So I wanted to just kind of address some of the common mistakes people make and maybe some things that they should head toward as opposed to um, adopt. Well, um, I just want to say when I when Dean Ramey became the dean of our law school as a law professor conference, and I mentioned that we had a new dean and her name is Drusilla Ramey, and the person I was speaking to had known you I mean, probably 20 years ago and said, does she still wear those hats? I remember her, she wear those hats. So you have successfully made this a trademark. <laughs> um, so shoes are a funny topic for me because I had knee surgery while I was in law school for a torn ACL and was unable to wear high heels for, I don't know, three years afterwards. I just, it, I couldn't do, I could not spend a day on heels if, if my knee would blow up. And so I was unable to wear them. So I came up with comfortable shoes, right? How can I wear comfortable shoes? And I don't know that I've found a solution yet other than finding now I can wear high heels and I've found comfortable high heels that I can wear. Um, I think if they're too high, I don't know how many people will notice it. It's more about Hooker shoes. I'm sorry? <laughs> I see it as hooker shoes. Hooker shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it can, it can detract from your credibility. That's the whole point to credibility, right? That's what we're going for. So if you might think that you look great in these shoes and that your legs look great in these shoes, then wear them on Friday night when you go out with your friends. Don't wear them on Tuesday morning when you're going to a partner meeting. That would be my advice. Um, in terms of things like boots, that's a very geographic fashion thing. So in San Francisco, people wear boots. In San Diego, when you wear boots and it's 85 degrees outside, you sort of look ridiculous, right? Like, why are you wearing these? It doesn't fit. Um, so in New York and San Francisco, I've noticed women can very successfully wear boots as part of a suit. Um, the thought high boots, we might be going closer to what Dean Ramey has titled hooker shoes, right? So, um, so that I think I might be a little bit concerned about as a lawyer. Um, you also, you know, I think there's something to be said for going outside the box and being the most fashionable person in your office, but if you go too far outside the box, then people are going to start commenting, as, as Professor Kwan said, on that's how you'll be known, right? You don't want to be the lawyer with the thigh high boots. You want to be the lawyer who just won that case last week. Well, shoes are, um, you know, have a lot to do with age, of course. I mean, I used to wear four-inch heels, uh, but I can't anymore because I have arthritis in my toes, which is why I wear open-toed and open-back shoes because I can't wear closed shoes very comfortably. But you will find that most most women lawyers have on their person at any one time three pairs of shoes. <laughs> they have the shoes they're wearing. They have uh, enough that are, you know, obviously, like if I, I gave a party for first year students last week, and, and it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. It was entirely appropriate for students to wear some shoes along that line, for example, something like that, um, because it was basically a business casual thing. It was a party. But to wear any.